Hey everybody, it's Peter, and this is the 2024 Kawasaki ZE-1 electric motorcycle. It is Kawasaki's first electric motorcycle, and right away I know you're going to fill my comments section with, I don't want an electric motorcycle, and that's fine. I didn't make it. What I am going to do though is talk about what this is, go through it in detail, and right off the bat I just want to point out this is not the electric motorcycle that I was hoping to see. It's probably not the electric motorcycle that most of you are going to want to consider, even if you're considering an electric motorcycle. It is a limited market. And kind of what Kawasaki has done here is while everybody else is still thinking about, talking about, and sort of developing in private their electric motorcycles, Kawasaki has released something that is going to be for the early adopters. It is not a mainstream motorcycle. It is not the motorcycle that I was hoping for, which was sort of that Z 400 Ninja 400 500 electric version. It's not that. It's slower speed, it's less range, but what we can do is look at this bike and evaluate where Kawasaki is headed because I think what Kawasaki has done is they've released a bike for us to comment on. Those of us who know stuff about EVs and again I had a whole career before I made these videos talking about EVs, learning about EVs. I used to be considered an expert on EVs so I kind of have a sense of what this bike is. I also happen to drive a Tesla. I happen to own an electric dirt bike so I'm familiar with the class I've spent a lot of time on other electric motorcycles so this one is interesting Kawasaki makes some interesting choices so do me a favor if you're not interested in this bike at all don't leave me a negative comment I didn't make it I'm just talking about it if you are interested in this kind of thing do me a favor and help me fill out that comment section and that like section and the maybe even the subscription section of this uh, website by filling those in because we know we're going to get some electric hate for just talking about this but I think it's interesting. So here we are filming at Jim Gilbert's Power Sports, Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, the number one volume Kawasaki store in the country, and they've got one of these. These are really, really rare. Someday they will be a collectible because things are going to move at least partially electric, if not fully electric. And electric is going to be an option for people in mainstream brands, and Kawasaki is giving us the first look at it. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to go through it in detail. Let's get going with this review. So before we get to the specs of this and how everything works, which is I think one thing that really isn't online a whole lot right now, I want to just sort of set the class. This is not the very first electric motorcycle. There are lots out there, there's other brands that are out there, and I've driven the main brand that's out there. We won't even mention it right now because I'm not reviewing them right now, but I've driven the main brand. And when I had, actually I didn't have that, my dad actually owned that one, so I got to drive that quite a bit. It was a lot more like a Tesla, very fast, but it handled fairly poorly, especially compared to the Kawasaki Versus I had at the time. So I was able to jump onto an electric motorcycle and a gas, an electric and gas, and I had, like I said, had a Kawasaki Versus 650 at the time. And the biggest difference I noticed was, although the acceleration on that bike was fun, the handling was not, and it really was not. What Kawasaki has done here has created a very lightweight motorcycle, and that's one interesting thing about electric motorcycles is you can make them fairly lightweight. This is 298 pounds as it sits right now, which is under 300 pounds, which is crazy for a motorcycle. And Kawasaki is known, especially in their sort of smaller lightweight market, think uh, Ninja 500, Z 500, Ninja 400, Z 400 that was just out, those bikes handle very well, and this will as well. And that's one thing that Kawasaki has kept. What they haven't done is, like I said, created that sort of Z400, Z500 in electric that we were hoping for. Range on this, according to the Canadian specs, is limited to 67 kilometers. Now, I think you might be able to squeeze out a tiny bit more just based on me kind of reading things, but that's what it's rated for. That's what they're saying. So that is pretty much scooter territory uh, for range. Top speed, about 85 kilometers an hour, and it's going to go up to about 101 kilometers an hour for a 15 second e-boost. We're going to talk about all those things, but right off the bat, even though it's not what I had hoped would arrive as the first step, that might be the second step. We can still take a look at what this is. We don't look at a Ninja 400, Ninja 500, and say, why is it not a ZX-10? We look at what it is, we compare it for what it is, and you can decide for yourself if it's right for you. So, 
Speed is limited, range is limited, but there's also some interesting decisions. It does have regenerative braking, but they make some decisions about where that comes in that's different than a lot of electric cars. It does have things uh, like forward and reverse, the way it operates, including a walk mode, and the way that operates is different than some other manufacturers are doing. So all of that stuff is stuff we're gonna dig into right now. Let's start at the front wheel, which is what we always do on a motorcycle. We're gonna work our way through just the basic motorcycle stuff and then work our way into the electric motorcycle stuff so you can kind of see what this is. This is gonna be a little longer review because there's a lot to talk about, but hopefully this will give you some information. Let's start at the front. So taking a look at the front wheel here, what you have is something that looks a lot like a Ninja 500 now. I was gonna say Ninja 400, but yesterday I reviewed the Z500, uh, which has just come out. And again, this looks a lot like that, but it's not. So we're gonna talk about a couple things. First of all, the tire size is a centimeter narrower. So it's a 100, I believe, instead of a, let me just look at the specs here. Uh, yes, 100 instead of a 110. So that's uh, two centimeters smaller than a super sport bike, one centimeter smaller than the Z500. and it is something that is going to maintain that flickability in a lightweight bike. The other thing is you have this single disc here that looks similar to the uh, Z500, Ninja 500, but it is also a slightly smaller disc, which is, again, sm uh, less weight, less speed. It's all the braking power you're gonna need. And really, when you compare it to some of the scooters that are around the showroom here, they sell Vespa here at Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals and Piaggio, uh, you've got a lot more braking power. So you still have that motorcycle feel as far as handling, as far as braking. But again, lighter weight uh, bike, lower speed bike, doesn't require as much braking. You will see there's an ABS ring in here, it does have that. And uh, standard size uh, shock tubes uh, here, similar suspension travel to uh, most other uh, small motorcycles. So again, Good stuff out front. Let's move to the heart of this bike. So I like what Kawasaki has done here because they generally try to keep this looking like a traditional motorcycle. You don't need this top silver piece here. There's some storage up there. We're gonna get to that. That's all for show, style, and like I said, a little bit of storage. And then instead of having a motor down here, you can see on this Z, again, no fairing, you do have this big box here. So hopefully you can see that box right there. In that box is two batteries. We're gonna talk about them in just a second. Back here is the motor, connects uh, to the back uh, through the chain on my side of the bike, and that's it. So your motor is very small, has plenty of power uh, for what it is. Again, small electric motors, you don't need big electric motors. And this area is used as battery. Now again, it's got quite a bit of room between the frame here. I think in the future you could fit almost another battery in here. It's got two, you could fit a third. There's room to make this better than it is, in my opinion, as far as range and as far as um, um, power goes, power would use more, uh, more power would use more battery, so you could do that. But there's room for improvement here, but what you have right now is very good uh, packaging here to keep the handling in line. Of course, no exhaust on this, that's gonna keep the weight down, it's gonna help with the handling as well, and it's also gonna just keep that really narrow profile here. Taking a quick look at the rear wheel here, the tire again, a little bit narrower than something like the Z500 would be. Different tread pattern as well on here, of course, different brand. So this is a 130 width tire. Uh, you have 150 on the Z500, you have 160 on the Z650, 180 on the you know Z900, for instance, and then 190s on the you know, full size bike. So 130 is a little bit narrower tire again, uh, which again, given the power, given everything else, it still allows that flickability, that handling. Now, because there's no exhaust, you get a good look at the brake, another solid disc brake here, or a good disc brake here with um, ABS ring in there. And you can see the chain runs through the other side there. So again, lightweight, simple, flickable, no problem. There is a little difference here. There's a little hole through here. I'll be very honest, I don't know what that's for. I wonder if that's for running a power cord through. We're gonna talk about charging this. Uh, it's just a guess, it's only on the right-hand side, it's not on the left-hand side, so it has some purpose. I'm just not sure what that is right now. As we look up from here, you can see very much sport bike styling. Let's take a quick look. Um, you know, just that typical sport bike styling. Sport bike styling. It is very clean looking and uh, very motorcycle-like. Take a look at the tail light here. A lot of people are gonna think this is the same as the Z500, it is not. You can see it has a different beam pattern. We did the Z500 on this channel just yesterday, so a little different uh, LED spread. But you do have LED lights on this bike, and again, LED signal lights. No four-way flashers, which is fine, but you do have LED lights, uh, which is, of course, typical on an electric vehicle, but not so typical on a um, you know lower-powered vehicle. Uh, hopefully, there we go, we got the focus back there. The other cool thing is you do have these little hooks right here, hopefully you can see there, there, uh, hook there and a hook there. It does give you an ability to tie things down to the rear seat if you wanted to. So there's the back end. Now let's start talking about some of this EV stuff that we've got going on. 
So take a look at the top here, the tank section, which of course is not a tank. This is, like I said, styling. Now there is a little rubber uh, uh, cap there and a little uh, key in here. Of course, nice modern key uh, style in the modern Kawasaki's. You flip that like this and this flips back and it holds all the way up. In here is where you have your batteries. Now I'm gonna move a little bit closer. We're gonna try to keep things relatively steady. Uh, that wasn't perfect, but we'll see what we've got here. I wanna kinda keep it in one shot here. So you do have an extra cover on here. And what that does is gives you all this open space to use as a storage area. Now you have quite a bit of it in here above your battery. So just worth noting that that is there. Now we can pop this open like this, take this off and it actually comes right off and you've got two batteries. So what we've done here is we have one fully charged battery or nearly fully charged. Yeah, it says 100%, it's upside down right now. And then other one that's uh, about 52%. So you can see that they can have different charge things. We haven't fully charged that one just for this video. And I'm gonna do that because I wanna show you that it shows you different fuel gauges, different battery gauges for the, um, in the dash here. So we'll talk about that in a second. Couple things worth noting about these batteries. They are removable. I can just pull it right out of here, simple like that, easy like that, they come right out. Now they are just over 25 pounds each. So that's why having two of them is nice. You can sort of balance that weight. They're quite heavy. As this bike sits, you have to pull them out to charge the battery um, from just as it comes. You have to pull them each out. You have a single charger, you can charge one at a time. There is an accessory cord that mounts underneath the rear seat, which we'll show you that underneath the rear seat in a second, which uh, does not come with the bike. I would definitely get that with the bike because then you can charge the batteries on the bike. Um, and then they'll charge together. In other words, you're not waking up in the middle of the night switching your charge from one to the other. So to me, that's a crucial thing. I think it should come with this bike, um, but it is pretty simple stuff. Um, you know, it's very simple. There's no connections. A lot of uh, e-bikes to have batteries will have complicated battery packs that you have to plug in and out. As long as you lift this straight out, uh, it's got the connectors in there. You can put them in either which way. I can spin this around, uh, put it that way, this way. It doesn't matter which side it goes. Uh, you just drop them in and they're connected. If there's a problem connecting, it'll tell you about it, but it's super simple stuff. So that's actually pretty good. All right, real quick, I have the battery back in. One thing worth noting is you do have to keep the key in here. It's not a slam lock, which I think it should be. Uh, you have to keep the key in there to lock that. It's just a little T style thing. Uh, I would prefer a slam lock, so just be careful you don't slam it or anything like that. Um, if you just look at the style of lock before, this is the kind of thing I do. I always look at everything that, uh, how it works, so I don't uh, damage anything, but yeah, have to keep the key in there. It is what it is. And then of course you can put the key in the dash. Let's take a look at the dash and start making sense of what you get in there. So taking a look at the dash here, if you just leave it off, this looks like a typical Kawasaki screen, but there's entirely new software in here. And that makes sense, right? Most of the Kawasaki's would have, well, every Kawasaki has an engine, has a tachometer. This does not have that. You have a totally different look here. So I'm gonna zoom in again. Hopefully you can see it clear enough. Yeah, it looks like you can. So it's telling me exactly how to start this bike. Now I'm gonna have to take it off the kickstand to start it to show you what we've got, but let's just talk about what we've got. First of all, you've got a battery temperature gauge there. So there is a temperature gauge. These are air-cooled batteries, a lot like like your cell phone would be, right? They don't have a liquid cooling that's gonna keep the weight down, but you can at least see what's going on. When the batteries get too hot, they will reduce performance. So you wanna be aware of those kinds of things. Um, and there's a lot of things we're gonna talk about here, which is gonna do with, to do with battery heat. You can see right now there's a mode here. We're in the mode that's an eco mode. I don't know if we can switch it to road mode. Uh, maybe we have to turn it on or maybe we have to fully charge all the batteries. We'll talk about that in a second, but there's a road mode and an eco mode. We're gonna talk about those in this video as well. Fuel efficiency or electron efficiency, I suppose. Um, 4.3 kilometers per kilowatt hour. You can change some of those settings in here, but let's just sort of show you up top. We can change, uh, there's the average, there's the range, so your distance to empty. Uh, there's uh, the instant efficiency. So instant efficiency, average efficiency, and range over there. Then you have odometer, trip A, trip B, and uh, that's it there. Clock's always on the bottom. And then on this side here, you have a fuel gauge and a fuel gauge. There's two, full, empty, full, empty. Those aren't fuel gauges. Those are your battery gauges. Remember we said the left side one had 100%, the other one had 50 some odd percent, 53 or something like that. So you can see that listed here or shown here. Um, for an actual digital readout of percentage, you have to look at the battery themselves. But if you just wanna see the bar graph, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't know, six or seven, uh, delineations there, uh, five or so, depends, the E might flash, but the point is those are there. So my understanding is both will drain equally, but again, if you didn't have time to fully charge them, this bike's still fully rideable to a point. Once uh, certain batteries get too low, then it doesn't have the full 
everything available to it. Now there is a walk mode. I don't think I can show you all that. I think what I'm going to have to do is take it off the kickstand. I'll try to hold it nice and steady for you um, to show you some of the rest of the modes and how this all works. Because again, this can be, this can be fully turned on. So we're going to show you what the modes are and then we're going to start explaining some of the complications with this system. All right, since I have to sit on the bike to take it off the kickstand and show you the uh, actual uh, rain, all the uh, dash things, let me just show you what it looks like to sit on this bike. So first of all, when you jump on this thing, this thing is really, really, really light. Like it's just, it feels exactly like a motorcycle. You still have a foot brake here, not a hand brake. In fact, there's no lever on the left side. We'll show you those controls in a second. You have a front brake, foot brake. So everything is exactly like a motorcycle, but there's also no gear shifting. So you can see I'm about six feet tall, proportional inseam is about the same as an average six footer. Uh, you can tuck in nice and close to this bike with your legs. You do have that sort of a little bit of a sporty kind of curl to your legs, fairly upright and comfortable seating position. Again, you're not having a ton of wind push you back because you're not driving 150 kilometers an hour. So the upright seating position is good and comfortable. Uh, mirrors are well placed like and large very comfortable motorcycle feeling uh, riding position here and still fairly low. If you're shorter, again, I'm easily touching the ground. It doesn't feel like the new Z500 or Ninja 500. It does sort of feel like its own thing, um, but it's certainly not unfamiliar if you're familiar with something like a Z500 or something like that. All right, let's try to show you the dash here now. Like I said, I gotta kind of keep it balanced, kickstand up, and we'll show you what we've got going on with the dash. All right, so I'm balancing the bike here. You're gonna see me shaking here. I'm up against my tripod, so hopefully you can sort of film this well. Again, I'm working alone here. So first thing I have to do is there's a start switch, kill switch kind of button on the side. Uh, you can see it's telling me exactly how to turn it on. I will point out that the neutral is, there's no gear shift in this. So it's just neutral and it has a sort of forward and reverse in a walk mode. But we're gonna turn the bike to the on position. As we do that, we're gonna hold it down and you can see what comes up here. So first of all, what have we got? You can see we're in drive. If I was to give the throttle now, we're gonna start going. Then there's this e-boost mode. This thing has, remember the top speed on this thing is limited to about 85 kilometers an hour, but it can go to 101 kilometers an hour for about 15 seconds if you have e-boost here. Now, I don't know exactly what that's supposed to look like. I know, I think when both batteries are charged, it'll sort of be a little bit better, but the idea with this e-boost mode is it tells you how much you have left of it uh, when you start using it. So I can sort of use the e-boost mode like that. You can see it lights up and it, you know, you can start using that throttle, using that throttle, and then it's gonna kick out. So. Why is it only 15 seconds? This is not, um, and I can kick it off as well. So I can turn it on, not use it. So again, if you turn it on, it's not like you instantly use it. You then use your throttle. So I'll show you the button I'm using, but basically I'm hitting a button beside my throttle, turning it on. Now, when I give it the full throttle, it's gonna go up to 101. If I turn it off without using it, then I give it full throttle, it's gonna go up to about 85. That's how it works. Now, again, I uh, will switch the mode here if I can. Maybe I have to hold the mode down, I'm not sure. It may not let me switch the mode because I haven't charged the batteries up full. Again, this is all new to me. I'm still learning some of this stuff. But you will see how much that e-boost mode. So let's talk about why you can only use that e-boost mode for a little bit of time. Basically, yes, it takes battery, um, you know, uses a lot of battery, battery drain, but it's also about temperature management. If you start using these batteries at full temperature all, or full speed all the time, you're gonna use full temperature all the time and that limits you. So the fact that you get that e-boost mode is basically a bonus. Otherwise they would just sort of limit it to 85 anyways. The other thing we should talk about is regenerative braking. You do have regenerative braking, but it will depend. Most electric cars around 90, 95%, they'll turn on the regenerative braking, which means you let off the throttle or you touch the brakes, it will regenerate into your batteries. This vehicle has that, but it's only about 60% battery where it gives you full regeneration. So it's going to blend it uh, from there. Um, so it does allow you to put some power back in as you're heading down a hill or as you're decelerating, that kind of thing. Uh, but it is something that is, uh, it's a decision, design decision they made to only put in around 60%. So we'll talk about why some of these things as we move a little further in the video, but that's kind of what you got. Let's look at the controls on the handlebars now. I just realized before we show you the, hand, the controls and handlebars, we should show you the walk mode. So the walk mode, I'm gonna hit a control on the handlebar, which I will show you in a second, but I wanna show you what the dash does. You can see it says forward or reverse, F or R. 
When you are straddled across this, the owner's manual says straddle across this for walk mode. Don't walk beside it, straddle across it. When you do that, you can go forward or reverse. Forward is five kilometers an hour, reverse is three kilometers an hour. To go forward, you roll the throttle on, and again, it'll limit it to five kilometers an hour. To go reverse, you back the throttle off. Again, that's different than some other electric bikes. A lot of other electric bikes, you have to hold some reverse button. Uh, again, it's just reversing the polarity of everything, so it's very easy to do. There's no reverse gear kind of thing. But it is kind of handy, especially if you're in like rougher terrain to walk it back. Do you need it on a 298 pound bike? No, but it's kind of cool to have. So forward again, roll forward, reverse, roll backwards on the throttle. Let's show you all those controls that allow you to unlock some of these modes. All right, left side controls, worth pointing out, there is no gear sh or no shift lever here. There's no gear shift on the left side. There's no shift lever here, so no lever at all. There is a little trigger right there where I'm pressing my finger. That will do a flash to pass. That's typical high uh, Kawasaki stuff. Um, that flashes your high beam, gets people's attention, if nothing else, or you can flash to pass. Then you got your high beam, your low beam, your signals, all typical standard Kawasaki stuff. So that all feels quality. And then you can see that mode, the section over here. Mode is gonna go drive modes, eco or road mode, and then that walk mode. You can hold that down and put it in that walk mode. Again, straddle the bike yourself and use it that way. That's how that works. Let's show you the other side controls because it's got a couple unique things on the uh, electric bike as well. So throttle side, the, the uh, throttle itself feels very natural, very normal, just like any other Kawasaki bike uh, right now. Again, Kawasaki knows how to make a throttle. They know how it should feel. They've got it blended. Kill switch is right there. Uh, you know, works like every other motorcycle kill switch. I think, believe that's just actually required by law on any motorcycle anyways. Then you can turn it to the on position, then the start position is combined. Now, a lot of Kawasaki's don't have the start position. Uh, so again, tap it to start while the kick stands up and the thing will come to life. I think you might have to hold it for a second, but it does uh, come to life. Then there's that e-boost button. So again, that's what's gonna unlock that extra speed. You can tap it to be turned on and then you've got full throttle uh, or full speed for at least 15 seconds or so. Um, and then you can tap it, turn it off. So that's the difference in the controls on this bike. Now let's start talking about the weirdness, the goodness, and the interestingness. All right, so I gotta be clear, this is a new bike to me, and when I get a new bike, I try to get my first video out to you as quickly as I can. I don't study it for a week first, I try to get it out. So this is the only bike I've ever done where I've gotta have the owner's manual out, and some information online, and some notes that I've written. So let's talk about charge time, because that matters in a bike with around 67 kilometers of range. So charge time is not super quick, because it's not something that plugs in like an electric vehicle with a level two plug. It plugs into the wall just like your cell phone. So when you take these two batteries out, total charge time is about 7.4 hours, which seems pretty slow, but again, they're very large batteries uh, for the type of charging system that you have. Now, it's worth noting that any electric vehicle is gonna charge way, way slower at the top. So if you were to charge them together, on the bike, you can get 20 to 85% in just 1.6 hours. So that is gonna be pretty good for most people to do their around town running. You're gonna get a lot of that back. It's quite slow charging uh, over at the other end. Now the problem that I have with this bike is it really should come with the attachment piece here. We have to show you in the back here. I'll show you in the back in a second. But it should come with the attachment piece that plugs in here that allows you to charge them on the bike because like I said, you might be charging one battery. As soon as it's done, you have to swap the cable to the second battery. Again, when these batteries are out of the bike, uh, that can also increase charge time. So you're gonna wanna buy the piece that comes in here, charge them on the bike, and if you need to pull them out, you can pull them out and charge them that way. So that's worth noting there. Uh, a couple other things worth noting, let's uh, talk about some of them right now. One thing that's just technically different on this bike that is the same with a lot of uh, electric cars is it does have a 12 volt battery. So even when these batteries are pulled out, you can check things like your efficiency, check things, whatever you need to check, but you can turn the dash on, it will come alive. Obviously it won't go anywhere with that uh, there. Okay, let's talk about a couple other things. We talked about that e-boost mode, that road mode versus eco mode, uh, different speeds and that kind of thing. If you drop this thing to below 35%, its top speed is limited. So 35% battery, its top speed is limited. Um, you know, to, now I've got miles an hour here, so we'll have to do the, com uh, to the uh, combination. Eco mode goes 40 miles per hour. I'm not sure what that is in kilometers. Um, it maxes out uh, in the road mode at around 55-ish or so. So if you're below 35%, you can't go to that road mode. You gotta go to eco mode, uh, which limits your top speed and of course eliminates that boost kind of thing. So there is some limitation of your top speed uh, in the lower battery things. And like I mentioned, same thing with the regenerative braking. You've got some limitation to um, 
you know, full regenerative braking or, you know, closing downhill charging the battery, which isn't a big deal. It's not going to do tons of charging, but it does do the charging. It's at 60%. Most electric cars are, uh, you know, 90%, 95% above. If you charge, for instance, a Tesla to full charge, it will not have the regenerative braking as well. So there is that. A lot of interesting quirks in here. Another thing that I've read about this that I can't confirm yet is there is a Ninja version of this and I've read that the Ninja has a slight little bit more range. So that's going to be an aerodynamic basis thing because they are the same powertrain, same basic bikes and that. But obviously there is some advantage to the Ninja's aerodynamics, which could help with range. Now, again, I haven't seen that fully confirmed. Uh, that's going to get a lot more range, but again, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference to a lot of people, but it's worth pointing out that just a kilometer or so or a kilometer or two uh, extra range potential in the Ninja versus the Z. Now, the other thing worth pointing out is these electric bikes, while they're very limited, there is also a hybrid bike that uses some of this technology, and that is not going to be a limited bike at all. It's going to be something that gives you like 250cc fuel efficiency if you wanted it, but it's going to give you leader bike performance if you want it with the e-boost function on there, and that in-between kind of riding uh, everything everywhere else. So that is another bike that's coming out. It's going to basically blend this with the Ninja 500 motor, and it's going to kind of, you know, fuse that into a bike that I think will be very interesting because it won't just be a hybrid it's going to be able to run purely on electricity just like this is in a round town situation so there's a lot of things going on with kawasaki right now let's put it all together for you as we wrap up this video actually before we wrap it up let's just show you behind here because we did promise that we'd show you that this uh, seat comes off that's typical of most sport bikes there and then this little piece lifts up over here and my understanding is this little gray connector in here let's see if we can get to a spot where we can show you that gray connector my understanding is that gray connector that you see in the very bottom of your screen there let's just try to zoom into that uh, all the way I believe it's this connector that the Kawasaki accessory piece pops into and allows you to charge while on the bike. So you would pop off the uh, rear seat, you would pop up this uh, handle here, just go wide angle. So rear seat, pop off, pop off the handle and you can charge in there. I do think that's an important accessory to get because it allows you to charge those batteries on the bike. It's convenient to be able to pull them off, throw them in your office, throw them in your house, that kind of thing. Uh, but you don't want to have to do that and you want to be able to charge both batteries together. That's the way to do it. There'll be an accessory that you can get and plug it into there. All right, so let's put this in perspective. Is this good? Well, first of all, we have to measure our expectations. I would like it to be faster. I would like it to have more range, but what we're talking about is what it is, not what I want it to be. For what it is, it is interesting. The technology is there. You've got battery systems that work. You've got little things that people don't always do. Removable batteries on a lighter weight bike makes a lot of sense. You have the option for just winterization to pull them inside. You have the option for with a bike with limited charge to pull them inside. Uh, maybe you don't have a plug where you park your bike at work or something like that. You can pull them inside and charge them. Having the two batteries instead of one makes it more portable. You're able to carry them both together. That makes sense. You've got the walk mode, which is interesting, not needed on a bike this light, but you can walk forward and a well done reverse mode. Those are all things that a good electric bike who's thinking about all the details should have. And again, I'm not looking so much at this bike, I'm looking at where Kawasaki is heading with their bikes. You do have regenerative braking. To me, to have maximum regenerative braking only below 60%, doesn't make total sense, but you have the technology for regenerative braking. It's a software decision on where you want to put that. The charging is not quick on this, but that's because of the way they plug it into the wall instead of having a level two charger. So again, not a big deal, but you've got all the components here that you would need. Air cooling on the batteries is perfectly fine for what a motorcycle is going to do. It's not going to get crazy, crazy hot, especially if you give it a little bit more capacity, a little bit more, uh, you know, power, that kind of thing. You're not running it at full throttle uh, with the boost mode all the time. You're going to be fine. So all that's good. The biggest thing is you have something here that looks like a motorcycle. It's going to handle like a motorcycle. And that's a key piece that not every EV manufacturer has been able to unlock. Some of the times they put these big batteries in, they don't, they're not used to making motorcycles that you can just tell it doesn't handle well the second you get on it. I have no concerns about the handling of this bike. So it's interesting. It's not for everybody as it's equipped, but the technology is here. So do me a favor, if you made it this far in the video, I am positive that I'm gonna get blasted in the comment section that 
EVs bikes aren't as good. Um, I'm going to blast in the likes versus dislikes section for people disliking it because I reviewed an e EV. I get it. It's not for everybody. I'm not ready to adopt this bike myself. But the technology is there, and as Kawasaki begins to develop this, I think they're on the right track. So if you're interested in this bike, yes, it is kind of a scooter competitor that gives you way better handling, way cooler looks, and is a leading edge, top of the line technology piece. It's a good bike for you. But for the rest of us, the pieces are there for Kawasaki to make something really interesting. And I think now that I've seen this, I'm definitely interested in seeing the hybrid that's about to come out as well, which we will have on this channel, because that is something that legitimately can replace a regular motorcycle if you want to. And it's going to have an EV mode. It's going to have a ton of power. It's going to be something that's really interesting. And I can see what Kawasaki's doing here. So again, most manufacturers haven't released something like this. Kawasaki took a risk and released this to the North American market where it's not gonna fit in as well as it does in other world markets but it allows us to comment on it, allows us to give our opinions. So if you have constructive comments for Kawasaki, constructive things of things you'd like to see, things you like or don't like about the spike, let's fill the comment section. Let's see what you have to say about it, and we'll go from there. I want to thank Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals. This bike is here. They are very few in Canada. If you are into this thing, absolutely, it's here. You can buy it. You can take it home yourself. There's going to be a Ninja as well, I believe, here, um, and we'll, we'll do videos on that as well. So thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll talk to you in the next one.